summer is bat season in Alberta. Each year, bats awaken from their winter roosts or migrate to the province in time for our warmest months. They're searching for good hunting grounds with plenty of insects to eat and cozy roosts to raise their young. Along the way, they inevitably encounter human habitations and all of the obstacles that come with them. Bats that are injured or entrapped due to human causes can count on our clinic for a chance at recovery and release back to the wild. Nine bat species make their homes in Alberta or visit for part of the year. Among them include little brown bats, big brown bats, silver-haired bats, and hoary bats. Many of Alberta's bats are considered sensitive species. This is due to habitat loss, wind turbines, and diseases. Bats also have long lifespans compared to other small mammals, often living over 10 years. While a female mouse might produce up to 30 babies annually, a mother bat only gives birth to one or two pups per year. This slow breeding combined with extended lifespans makes each individual bat vital for the continuation of their species. We're honored to be able to help bats in need at our clinic and return them to the wild. All of Alberta's bats are insectivores, and some of their favorite foods include moths, stink bugs, beetles, and other agricultural and garden pests. When bats visit human spaces on the hunt for insects, they come into contact with a variety of threats, including windows, netting, and vehicles. The most common reason bats come into our clinic is because they've been grounded. No, that doesn't mean that they've lost their video game privileges. It means that they've become stuck on the ground. Alberta's bat species can be clumsy on horizontal surfaces, meaning any obstacle that forces them to make a landing there can be a recipe for disaster. Bats that struggle to take off can't feed or drink and have no defense against predators, including free roaming cats. A recent analysis of data from rehab centers across Canada showed that the number one source of trauma for bats in care are cat attacks. Even if a bat escapes a cat, injuries to their wings or infection from cat saliva can still be fatal. Another major cause of bats coming into care is entrapment. While searching for places to roost, they can enter buildings and other human structures without an easy exit. When trapped like this, bats can be severely weakened by lack of food and water. White nose syndrome, a potentially deadly fungal disease that infects bats during hibernation, has been recorded in Alberta and is the main reason little brown bats were classified as endangered in 2018. Finally, while we rarely see bats injured this way in our clinic, wind turbines cause significant fatalities to migratory bats during the fall migration season. Thankfully, when a bat is in need, we're able to help. The number one rule when rescuing and caring for bats is safety. Bats are considered a rabies vector species, and so our rescue drivers and staff who handle them take special precautions. Because they're so small, there's a lot of things we have to take into account to keep them safe as well as us. They're keeping us safe, we wear gloves, sometimes we'll wear masks as well if they're acting sick at all. If they're bright and healthy, then we usually are wearing at least nitrile gloves and leather gloves as well to protect our hands from any kind of bite. And then to keep them safe, we want to be very gentle when we hand them. They have, you know, extra tendons in their feet and things to hold on so they don't have to use energy. So we have to be very careful when we're picking them up and taking their hands and feet off. They're so tiny, we don't want to hurt them at all. And then restraining them, we want to be as fast as we can when we're doing things because they can overheat or get too cold if they're under anesthesia. So we try and make things quick while we're looking at them to reduce their stress and to not put too much pressure on their little bodies. Yeah, we usually start them in a little smaller kind of kennel. It's like a soft-sided, I think it's actually a butterfly cage is what it's sold as so it's all mesh and soft that way they can crawl up the walls of it and we'll hang different things in it for them to crawl and hide and nestle in and then depending on if we think they're injured or they just need time to get their strength back and rehydrate we'll slowly graduate them to a full room that's also kept warm and humidity is added into that room so they can fly around we have an insectivore enclosures to test them if they can fly and get them outside and used to the weather before we release them. They're insectivores, so sometimes we do have to teach them, you know, what a mealworm is and how to eat it out of a bowl or off the tweezers. It's very different to flying around and eating insects at night, but we sometimes do have to teach them, like, by, you know, putting a little bit of it in their mouth, getting them used to the taste of it, showing them the mealworms are in this bowl at the bottom of your kennel. A lot of ours get grounded or kind of stuck in places that they're not 
supposed to end up in. So sometimes they end up in people's houses, sometimes they just end up on the ground and they don't have the energy to crawl back to shelter or they're out during the day or something like that. Those ones a lot of the time just get dehydrated and exhausted. So a couple days or a week of fluids and giving them extra feedings, often we can get them back out pretty fast. They can get tears like in their patagium and their wings, they can get wounds as well. They're very tiny and they're very intense groomers. So if you were to suture up a wound, they will like rip the sutures out immediately. So we have to use other ways, either leaving the wounds open and just treating them regularly, or we'll use like surgical glue, skin glue on wounds or on tears in their wings to try and keep them shut without something that they can pull out and pull off. While we at the AIWC do everything we can to help bats in need, it is often community actions that make the biggest difference for Alberta's flying mammals. Um, my name is Susan Holroyd. I work with the Alberta Community Bat Program. Um, we're part of Wildlife Conservation Society Canada. Bat houses can work really well in the cities, like in urban centers. I would say that's the best place for bat houses um, because those are areas where we've removed natural habitat. Cities and towns are often in the best habitat too. We're, we tend to snuggle up to the rivers and we're in the riparian zone and, and that's the best habitat for bats. So that can be helpful, but it's not always a bat house. Um, I actually think replacing some of your yard with native plant species. Um, the native plants support the insect prey that our aerial insectivores eat. So it's not just our bats that would benefit from that, but it's also all the aerial insectivorous birds. As part of taking the bat pledge, because uh, we have a bat pledge, and, and one of those things is to learn about bats and then share that information with other people. Um, because bats still have a lot of uh, stigma around them. People, Some people are just deathly afraid of them. And often it just takes a few bat facts and they change their mind about them. Finally, if you find a bat that is visibly injured, not flying when approached, or is trapped in a building, please give our wildlife hotline a call at 403-946-2361. Or check out the Alberta Community Bat Program's Found a Bat page, link in the description. If you would like to help us care for bats in need, please consider becoming a monthly donor. Not only are you ensuring regular income to help us feed hungry bat mouths, you'll also gain access to an exclusive behind the scenes gallery. Link in the description to donate. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Alberta Wildlife Insider. See you next time.